In this snip, we're going to talk about how to manage IIS web bindings in PowerShell. So to start off with, there are a few prerequisites that I'm going to expect you have. First is IIS is installed on the remote server. In this case, in this SNP, we're going to be working via a PowerShell remoting session, and you need PowerShell v5 on that remote server. Also, there's a SNP prereq here of how to create a self-signed certificate with PowerShell. So be sure to check that out if you don't know how to create a self-signed certificate, because later on in this SNP, we're going to be using a self-signed certificate to do some uh, binding demonstrations. So I've already connected to my remote computer, my remote web server with PowerShell remoting, and I've already imported the web administration module into this session. So the first step, let's first work with a, an individual website. So in this instance, I'm just going to work with the default website. And you can see there that it's just a default website. The state is stopped. You can see the physical path and some of the bindings. So notice that the bindings are bound to the HTTP protocol, the asterisk, which is all IP addresses, and then port 85. And we're going to be manipulating that throughout this SNP. All right, so the first thing we do to just see the bindings with a little bit more detail is use the get web binding command. This command just extrapolates out that binding property a little bit and provides some great in-depth information about this. And I'm not for sure, but I believe that this also provides some more properties here under the covers. Let's see here. Yes, so uh, we can pipe that to select star to get all of the different properties that are available for this. So we also get, in addition to those ones we just saw, these certificate hash and certificate store name along with some um, XML elements that come from the XML file. To use this set web binding command requires the name of the website that I'd like to change, the existing binding information, the property name of port and the value of 81. So I'm going to bind this website to port 81. All right, once that's taken care of, I can then look at the website again. And now you can see that the binding information is to port 81 now. So now it is at port 81. We can also dive down here a little bit deeper and then look at the bindings.collection. You can see that the get web binding command and the dot bindings.collection property that are returned from the website are essentially the same thing. Next up, let's just kind of put this all together. There's not a whole lot about changing web bindings, but create a function, a standard function that provides a bunch of default values and some error handling so that we can just call this function new IIS web binding for all of the instances that we need to change web binding for. So let me show you what this looks like. So this is my custom function, and this kind of encapsulates everything that we need and provides a more intuitive way to actually change these web bindings. So you can see here in the parameters that we have the computer name, which is the computer name of the remote web server that I would like to change. The website name, we obviously need the website name. The protocol, notice that I'm using a validate set here, for HTTP and HTTPS because I only want to be able to provide HTTP and HTTPS as strings to the protocol. And then we have the port, which we, ought, we always need to port if you're going to change the binding information, we're going to want to change the port. And notice that all four of those are mandatory, so that we have to include those. If we didn't encapsulate all of this into our own function, then we weren't able to set things like mandatory or set default values and things like that. And then finally, we have IP address, which we're going to just set to all zeros. That just means it defaults to accepting all the inbound IP. So we are able to set default values here as well. And then finally, we have credential there, which is the PS credential object, which allows us to connect to the remote computer uh, with alternate credentials via PowerShell remoting. And then inside of here, it's not a whole lot different. The actual code to make this happen is not a lot different than what we went over, but the the biggest difference is allowing us to do error handling and data validation and adding default values. Those are kind of the two big things here. First off, on line the 63 through 67 there, we're essentially just taking input from the IP address, and then if it's equal to 0 to 0 to 0 to 0, we're just going to have it star. So we need to manipulate that, change that, convert that into a format 
that the new web binding command will understand. And then 69 through 75 there, we're creating a script block, which will be passed to the remote web server via PowerShell remoting. And we're importing the module web administration to make the get and new web binding commandlets available in that session. And then here we are using get web binding. We're actually checking to see if the web binding exists ahead of time. So we're able to validate some uh, environmental states ahead of time. If it is, it's going to throw an error. It's going to return the function and not continue. But if it's not, it's going to run new web binding. And we're able to pass the name, IP, port, and protocol, um, all of the different parameters that we provided there. And then on line 77 through 84 is just we where we are able to build up all the parameters that are necessary to connect to the web server using invoke command. And then we are able to just run that script lock on the remote computer. So let me bring this into memory here. Let's exit out of my interactive session here and let's bring this into my session. All right, once it's into my session, let's just run it and see what happens. So I'm going to be running this by providing a computer name, which is dollar computer name in this instance, which is the going to be the remote web server. It is an IP address at this point because I'm just running these commands on a remote Azure web server not attached to a domain. I'm using the credential, uh, the alternate credential that I have to connect to this remote web server. I'm defining the website name, which is just the, just the default website. We can change that if we like at any time. The protocol, HTTP, and the port of 82. So let's see if this works. I will copy this out and paste this in. Okay, we didn't receive any kind of errors at all. We're assuming that it worked. Let's just see. Well, we'll run it again. And now that you can see that it says there's already a binding with the protocol because it will not allow us to do this again. It's going to return an error. It's smarter than what you would typically just run these um, get and set IAS binding commands. So we can actually see if it's set. We're assuming that it is since it defaulted uh, out to that error message. And then let's see here. We can see that, yes, the protocol is HTTP. The binding information is 81. So yes, it did change the binding OK. So that is a, uh, an example function that we can create called new IIS web binding. Next up, we have a custom function to change an existing web binding. So we just created a new one, so we need one to change. In this case, it's the same sort of principle. We're providing parameters here, some common parameters that we need, and then allowing us to pass all those in, set some default values, do some error validation, that sort of thing. In this instance, now we have support for our certificates. So we have a parameter for certificate thumbprint. We have a location for the certificate, which in this instance, I'm, it's defaulting to local machine, but you can see there that in the validate set attribute, we can also do current user as well. We're able to kind of build out this functionality. And then we have the certificate store name. It defaults to my, which is the personal store. But now again, using validate set, we can ensure that it's specific string values that we need that are actually legitimate certificate stores. And then finally, we have the credential object, which is a PS credential object that we can provide to connect remotely to the remote machine. And then inside of the, the function, there's really not a whole lot going on. We are simply building up all the parameters necessary to run invoke command. They're on 157 through 162. Then on 163 to 172, we are invoking that script block in via PowerShell remoting on that remote web server. So we're importing the web administration module. Again, we need that to make some of the command lists available and also the IIS PowerShell drive available. And then now we are going to be changing the certificate thumbprint. So we have, if a certificate thumbprint is used, then it's going to start dynamically building out all those values that we need. So we need the cert path for that PowerShell drive. Since we provided location, certificate store name, and certificate thumbprint, all of that is able to be built up for us. The IIS path, so the path to the IIS drive that the binding is going to exist on, that's all built out for us. And then finally, we are just getting that item. So we're grabbing the certificate from the certificate store and then setting, which then we pass to the set item command. We pass that to the IIS drive, which then adds that certificate thumbprint to the existing IIS binding. Well, let's see if this works. I will bring this into my session here. All right, once that's in, we first need to provide a certificate since this is going to be an SSL binding. We need to make sure that the certificate exists. 
I've already created a self sign certificate on that remote server. So I will go ahead and check this out and see if this exists. So I assign this a variable so I can check the variable here. And now you can see that there is a test cert um, on that remote machine. I want to use this test cert certificate thumbprint to bind this via SSL to the website. To do that, I will first create this binding on here because we are demonstrating changing a binding. So I just want to add this first and I'll do this with set IIS web binding. So we'll go ahead and run that and then that connected out to the remote machine and changed the cert binding to show the certificate thumbprint that we're working with and to port 8080. To demonstrate this function that we just created called set IIS binding, we can now provide the wrapper function that we created, the computer name, the credential, which is just the information that we need to connect to that remote web server. We're providing the port, which is the port that the SSL binding is going to be created on. And then finally, we have a certificate thumbprint option, which we are passing that via the certificate that we just got. And then finally, we can check the SSL bindings by running invoke command here. And then now you can see that port 80, that thumbprint that we provided for that certificate has been set. Now to check and see what this thumbprint is, let's just make sure this is the one we set, 6A94, yep. We have just created a custom function called set IIS binding that wrapped all of the logic necessary to change an IIS binding, either HTTP or SSL, into one single cohesive function. So that has been how to manage IIS web bindings with PowerShell.